So the last topic, I, <laughs> uh, when we t- we're talking about what we're going to be playing, um, I talked about at length the Battlefield 1 intro sequence, and it's something that you can only really experience for yourself. It was really hard hitting, it really made me think, and it was beautifully pieced together. Like It was so well respected of the individuals in that war, and it kind of set the stage for this isn't your normal Battlefield game, this isn't a Call of Duty-esque campaign where there's explosions and gunfire and rah rah rah, this is serious. This is a war that happened. Real people died. Real people died, you know. I can't get over them showing those real names. And um, it, it, it was just crazy to me. But anyways, my topic is like, I want to talk about why video games don't really approach real history that often. And obviously there's some a lot of made-up parts of Battlefield 1, um, but its its foundation is in real history in The Great War. And um, so was Valiant Hearts, and I love that game. Um, do you guys want to see more real history in video games, like games based on real history? Like the walking sim gen uh, uh, genre can kind of fix that. Like, what do you guys want to see as far as real history in video games? I, I do want to point out that Assassin's Creed is essentially built. It has mm, built its empire yeah. upon history. That's what I makes guess, those yeah. games most interesting. True. It's gameplay's... also like a sci-fi game in a way. It's weird. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, the gameplay is, you know, good at best for the most part. But it's just being in those different historical worlds. Like, true. To this day, I still really want to play Assassin's Creed Three, even though everyone says it's an awful game, because I love the American Revolution. That's such a cool time to me. I'd like to see how they handle that. Apparently, it wasn't that well, but yeah. it's not an awful game. It's just a, it's rough around the edges. Also, one thing I want to bring up about Assassin's Creed real quick. I was thinking recently about how um, I, I'm not trying to like really defend it here, but the thing is, is there's no other game that gives you the freedom of movement that Assassin's Creed does. And so everyone bashes it and says, oh, well, I tried to jump here, but it didn't work. I think if they're, you know, I, I, I'm i really not trying to bash on Uncharted, but there are times on Uncharted where I'm like, okay, I'm jumping here, and then Nate just, like, falls off a fucking cliff. So um, I feel like four games, like, if there was any other game that gave you as much freedom of movement as Assassin's Creed, I definitely think that... Um, those games would have just as many issues. So wait for that Spider-Man um, game. That game's gonna have a whole lot of free freedom of movement. Hopefully, true. Yeah, true. I, like Infamous uh, Second Son, even it doesn't have nearly as much freedom of movement, just because it is kind of directing you along a path. Um, but as far as the the whole history thing goes, I think um, one of the reasons, Jared, is because you know as soon as this Battlefield One stuff started coming out. People are like, oh, using mustard gas as a game uh, mechanic is so, so insensitive. And, you know, using this uh, historical time setting, uh, time setting, I don't know why I just said that. Um, (laughs) But using this historical setting is so insensitive. And how could you ever, like, you know, monetarily capitalize off of these types of things? And so I think it's, uh, it's fear of backlash in a lot of ways because history is a very sensitive topic for a lot of people especially because of a lot of bad things that have happened in history. And so when you try to touch on those subjects, you know, people get really, really touchy-feely, and um, it's tough to get through that without um, just extra, extra criticism that you wouldn't have if you're making, you know, a, a fictional quantum break or whatever. So that's that's why it's cool that Battlefield 1 is doing exactly what Jared describes where it's it's simultaneously like honoring those people that did lose their lives in different ways so it's not just monetizing it it's monetizing it but making a great game presumably and kind of paying telling some a story yeah and telling a story yeah so it's there like this is I which looks like it's shaping up to be a good example of how to handle that kind of war in a video game it looks like they're doing it pretty well so also, don't forget that Battlefield One in its current state almost didn't exist because publishers didn't feel that people wanted to play World War One. Um, True. Yeah. So we have to think about that too. The thing is, is I think with the rise of indie games and the rise of walking simulators, I think walking sims could be. We talked about walking sims with Ian. I think walking sims are a beautiful introduction to real history because, you know, there is some weird, disrespectful stuff that people might call out if you're, you know, shooting people in a game that's historically accurate and stuff like that. But in a walking sim, you usually don't do anything but walk around and explore and take in everything, and it's totally environment based. And uh, I was talking about before the show, like with the emergence of VR, wouldn't it be great to experience the Gettysburg Address or Martin Luther King's speech there in person and look around and see 
in a first hand experience these events and like that's not a video game per se but like I do agree with you that the reason a lot of this isn't happening is because people feel that it's too insensitive or this or that. But guess what? A lot of history is insensitive. A lot of bad things happen in yeah. history. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't, you know, look yeah. back and remember those things. Like you know, that's right. why we watch Roots. Exactly. Like, There's a fi- or uh, Twelve Years a Slave. There's a yeah. famous saying that says, "If you don't know your history, you're bound to repeat it." And I think. Um, the, if, if there really is an emergence in history in video games, that'll lend itself to having more video games in the classroom because I do think if they're implemented in a correct way, I think having video games um, and teaching history that way will be a good way of teaching history to kids because history, I think, is one of the hardest subjects to teach to kids because they find it so boring and monotonous. But if you're able to put them in this 3D space and let them explore for themselves, I think it'll be a in- really interesting way to get history back in the forefront of people's minds because... A lot of important things happened, and I think that, you know, there's a lot of interesting things you can do, and you kind of have to skirt the line of what the real history is, because there's plenty of fake history, quote-unquote, in our history books and that we're fed, and you, it's up to the developers and the creators to give us the real story, not the story yeah. we they people want us to be told, um, and I'm excited for that. Um, I'm, I'm super interested in the history of video games too. Speaking of history and video games, I think it's really cool with Daniel Dwyer's new project of doing documentaries and stuff like that. Like we, I, we talked about it before, I wanted a 30 for 30 for video games and he's essentially making that, so that's gonna be cool. Um, but as far as Battlefield 1, I'll report back to you guys. I still have like nine hours to play on it. I'm gonna start, I'm not gonna really use any of that time in the multiplayer. I wanna dive into that story because it's so intriguing. Um, Probably finish it. Yeah, hopefully. And I'll report back to you guys. I, I, they're calling them War Stories too, and they're specific vignettes. So um, the first character is the one that kind of looks like the dude from Mr. Robot from the trailer. I don't know if you guys remember from the Battlefield mm. 1 trailer. There's a guy at the end that kind of looks like the lead guy in Mr. Robot. The first worst story is him, and it's five parts. So we'll see how that goes. But I'm super intrigued by history and video games, and we'll see what comes next. Yeah, I definitely feel like it. you, know, you were talking about um, actually having the realism there and not sugarcoating it. And I think that's a very important part. You know, the people that are complaining about Battlefield 1, it's like, well, they use mustard gas in World War One. so would you rather us just, you know... Yeah, exactly. Would you rather us, like, have you throwing rainbows at them and you just pretend it's mustard gas? You know, it's... it's yeah. You do, if you are making a historical game, just like a historical movie, um, you know, in, yeah, in 12 Years a Slave, like, Michael Fassbender beats the living shit out of this slave, and... Um, it's really the real way that it happened. It's not, you know, it's not sugarcoated whatsoever. And so um, sugarcoating history is a dangerous thing to do. And so I think video games can be some of the realest ways to experience that and to get that perspective. Let's come at it from the other direction. Like for, we used to have a ton of World War II games, not so much anymore. But World War II, I mean, if you ask someone, they'd probably tell you that it was an, an awful thing. But if yeah, you look at it yeah. from a different side, it was a great thing because we stopped the Nazis. You know what I mean? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Like, that's what it took. It's, I don't know, just also, another perspective, Also, I most of the history games we've gotten have been shooters. And I think that's what kind of yeah. pushes people off of it, too, is because, like, I don't want to shoot people that already died. So I think putting <laughs> history in different genres will help, too. So it's going to be interesting. I'm excited to see where Battlefield 1 takes me.